<clears throat> okay. Hello, everyone, and welcome to History Happy Hour, the WPA in Indiana. My name is Callie McCune, and I serve as the Manager of Engagement at the Indiana Historical Society. It's great to have so many of you here this evening. I'm going to go over a few pieces of logistics before I pass the mic to our speakers. At the Indiana Historical Society, we are Indiana Storyteller connecting people to the past. We do this by collecting paper-based items like books and paintings, letters, photographs, diaries, postcards, and more, and th that all tell Indiana's unique stories. We then find ways to share them through publications, exhibitions, or events like this. It's through these documents that we tell the diverse stories of Indiana and inspire a future grounded in our state's uniting values and principles. Tonight, we are also going to look, we're going to look at the Works Progress Administration in Indiana and see how these New Deal programs have lasting impacts today. But before I hand it over to our moderator, Ray, I just have a few pieces of logistics to share with you. For tonight's program, Glory, June, and Ray will talk for about 50, 35 minutes and then we'll open it up to your questions. If you have any as we go along, please feel free to drop them in the question and answer section of your Zoom screen. We'll keep an eye on them and add them in in the second half of our program. Um, if you'd like to add anything to the conversation, please use the chat box. Just don't forget to change your responses to all panelists and attendees so we can all see your thoughts. Keep an eye on the chat. I'll also be dropping in links and URLs as we go along throughout the conversation. Don't worry if you miss one, we'll deliver those to your inbox in an email tomorrow morning. This program is being recorded. You can catch the replay on our website, indianahistory.org and on YouTube in the upcoming weeks. And if you enjoy this program, we hope you'll consider coming back for more. Our happy hours continue in two weeks with um, a program on the 500 Festival Princesses with a panel of alumni and current princesses. It is May, of course, so we can't help but talk a little bit more about the Indianapolis 500. And then stay tuned for conversations on Juneteenth and the history of canning coming up in the summer. You can sign up for all of this at indianahistory.org and other virtual offerings coming to an internet connected device near you. So without further ado, I'm going to toss this over to Ray Boomhauer, Senior Editor at the Indiana Historical Society to get us started. Hi, Ray, thanks for helping out tonight. Glad to do it, Callie. Always glad to talk about uh, interesting aspects of Indiana history. And I'm here to talk with uh, Glory June Greif. I'll give you a little bit of background about Glory June. She's a public historian and preservation advocate uh, living now in Indianapolis. Uh, she's written about uh, 80 National Register of Historic Place nominations across Indiana, and for the past uh, more than th three decades has been researching the work of the uh, New Deal and WPA projects in the Hoosier State. Uh, she's a native of the Michigan area, uh, my home area as well. She received her undergraduate degree from Butler University and has a master's degree in public history from Indiana University. She's also a longtime contributor to the IHS Press. In 2005, we published her book, Remembrance, Faith, and Fancy, Outdoor Public Sculpture in Indiana. And she's also contributed many articles to our public history magazine, Traces of Indiana and Midwestern History. And her last piece appeared in the summer 2020 issue. And it was titled, uh, The Pot of Gold and Other Myths, The Life and Death of Hindustan, Indiana. So it's a welcome, uh, Glory June, to our program this evening. And because this is our uh, Hoosier History Happy Hour, uh, of course we're staying we're staying alcohol free for the program. But right. if you were around in 1933, what do you think you'd be drinking? Well, remember prohibition will have just ended in 1933, and I would celebrate probably with a beer from one of the newly opened breweries in Michigan, which would be the South Bend Brewery or the Cam Brewery in uh, Mishawaka, your hometown, right. or, <laughs> or the Musel Brewery, which soon was to become the Drury's Brewery in South Bend. Great. 
I'm wanna, German after all. <laughs> that's true. Right. It's right up with your heritage and mine is as well as you can probably tell Boomhauer is a German name. I'm going to ask you what inspired you to do all this work uh, on WPA projects in Indiana before we get into it uh, too closely. Um, what was it that about that subject that got you interested in uh, doing work well, on about it? You know, it's it's funny. My my dad even asked that when I when I first started. Like, why are you interested? Because he, of course, remembered the depression all too well, and it wasn't a very pleasant thing to him. But uh, I was fascinated by their construction. And in, in Indiana, as it turned out, it was a very good place to be to see that. I grew up between Michigan City and South Bend, Mishawaka. So about equally, I would see Washington Park in Michigan City, which to my great delight, many years later, I wrote the National Register nomination for, so that was exciting. And Battelle Park in Mishawaka, your hometown, which has this fabulous, uh, I called it in, in one, uh, one article I did, a fountain staircase cascade uh, yeah. piece of rock work that, that cascades down about a, a 200 foot bank down, the, yeah. down to the St. Joe River. I think Callie's going to share that. There, there it is. It is. Yeah. There's Battelle Park. That's, you can't see the whole thing in one photograph because it just keeps going. Right, it's it starts just, from the top and goes all the way down to the river. Yeah, and, and uh, drains into that and just re keeps recycling river water, at least it did originally. I'm not sure what state it's in today. I haven't been there in a while, but uh, at various times over the years when I went to see it, it was not in good shape, but I, I could sure see how beautiful it was and how imaginative the architect was who designed it. It's they did amazing. for architects to work too. Yeah, amazing piece of work. Uh, I remember I was a we grew up just a few blocks away from Battelle Park, so it was really a place that I went to a lot uh, when I was a, a kid growing up in the Princess City. And I think I remember <laughs> actually goldfish in some of the pond areas no kidding. Uh, yeah. at, the, uh, at the park. But uh, well, There's a similar one um, in Washington Park in Michigan City, except it's all flat. So okay. it, ki it kind of uh, goes around and... and uh, Sort of a zigzag pattern but has a lot of the same features and in that case they're all chunks of granite from the lake and the big thing in michigan city is the tower that's on top of the tallest dune in the park so the dune's about oh 200 feet high or close to that and then on top of that is a four-story tower which is made of recycled material so it's just it's just a really cool thing and i i it it actually said wpa on it it's right. a WPA 1935, and I said, you know, Mommy, what's that? Mm -hmm. And she told me what she knew about it, and I don't know. It just always stayed in my mind. Let's set the stage for our, our viewers this evening uh, of what life was like in Indiana, say, in 1933, during the, the height of the Great Depression. I'll set a little bit of the stage uh, for you before we get to Glory June. You know, Indiana was inaugurating a new governor, Paul McNutt, and uh, he was worried about a possible revolution even because things were so bad. In his inaugural address, he reminded people that through the ages, uh, hungry people have been in the vanguard of every revolt against the established order. And in Allen County, where there were 5,000 families on uh, poor relief, uh, some uh, government officials there were worried about being confronted with riots and violence because so many people were out of work and, and in need of help. And Gory June, I know that you talked to a lot of people, a lot of Hoosiers who remember those times. And what did they tell you about that period in their lives? What did they remember most? You know, the, the line that I kept hearing repeated by so many, and this was back in the 80s when I first started this work. And at that time, there were still a fair number of WPA veterans, you could say, still around. And I think to a man, and it was mostly men I talked to, said, you could not buy a job. I mean, which means that there were no jobs to be had. Uh, unemployment was at 25% and higher in some places. In Lake County, it was even higher. Um, they, they were desperate. And there was no, un until the New Deal came along, there was no relief. 
Uh, the previous administration did not believe government had a role in that. They were supposed to stimulate the economy in some fashion. They never did quite figure out how to do it, but they could not see the government stepping in and, and creating jobs. And the, the idea of creating jobs was, of course, brought up before Roosevelt, but President Hoover was not interested in that. Um, Governor Leslie, before Paul McNutt, was not interested in that. Um, they saw that was not the role of the government. It would destroy democracy in, in some way. Meanwhile, people were dying. They were starving to death, literally. And there are statistics to show that. Along came the New Deal and things began to change right away. Roosevelt came in on a landslide. People heard he had ideas. At, at first they sounded kind of light, but what, he said things like, you know, we're going to take a lot of these ideas and we're gonna throw them at the wall and see if they stick, basically. And if it doesn't work, no harm done, we'll try something else. He, he didn't even guarantee that all these ideas would work, but he felt we should try something, anything, as opposed to his predecessor who did not seem at least, I mean, he felt he was doing something, but to the general country, it didn't look like he was doing anything. But uh, at the moment he did create um, uh, a sort of a, a heavy works uh, program, but it, it went too slowly. It was sort of a trickle down theory. And as we know, trickle down th theories don't really work. So it was just too slow, too little. And people, meanwhile, were starving. So there was a bonus army, you know, that marched on Washington and, and Hoover wanted them to leave. MacArthur drove them out with tanks. I mean, it's, that's, that's a terrible thing. Uh, yeah, what, what, one of my favorite stories from the early days of the FDR administration, you know, some of the bonus army marchers were still in Washington. And mm -hmm. uh, he sent uh, his wife, uh, Eleanor, to talk with them. Yeah, and, always and, <laughs> and, and one of the people, one of the uh, World War I veterans said, you know, Hoover sent tanks and, and Roosevelt sent his wife. So that was exactly, exactly between uh, the two. He wasn't able to give them their bonus money either. No. At least, but what he did do was offer them jobs in the CCC. So there were veterans right. companies in the CCC, but I'm getting ahead of my story. Yeah, well, so. we're, let's, let's get into that. We'll talk about the various, uh, what we call the alphabet agencies, the various programs, New Deal programs that uh, FDR initiated, uh, starting with the Civilian Conservation Corps in 1933 and a variety of other uh, agencies that came into being that led into and were kind of flowed into the Works Progress Administration when it was established on May 6, 1935. But I know you've done a lot of work with uh, yep. state parks in Indiana, and they were a big beneficiary of the CCC. Oh, exactly. And their activities. So if you talk about what they did for some of the state parks in, in Indiana. Roosevelt did not waste any time uh, after his inauguration. I mean, he literally started the next day and began creating legislation, uh, giving executive orders and so on. Uh, as you say, the CCC uh, was one of the very early, uh, and we have a photograph of that. There yes, you go. Was, <laughs> see guys, uh, in contrast to the Works Progress Administration, now they didn't come till 1935, but they did some of the same kind of work. And incidentally, the WPA did work in our state, some of our state parks as well. But the CCC was a great favorite of Roosevelt. He was an ardent conservationist. He experimented privately at his at his home in Hyde Park, New York. And he developed a sort of a CCC type program when he was governor of New York. He did that for the state of New York. The CCC was a very successful program for the most part. It, its goals were twofold. One was to get conservation going again to do tree planting, flood control, uh, erosion control, all these sorts of things, but also to get these jobless youth off the streets and help prevent trouble before it started. Mm -hmm. And now these, I talked to hundreds, probably close to two or 300 CCC veterans. We've pretty much run out of them now too. There are a few still around, but they are getting to be in their mid to late nineties. Um, but when I first went around in the 80s and 90s, I talked to many CCC veterans and without fail, they all loved the program. They all said they gained weight because they were eating three squares a day for the first time in a long time. They were out there doing heavy work, so they were gaining muscle and they loved it. They loved the life. 
you can say that this was run in a military fashion. Well, how better to control a lot of restless young boys, you know? Right. right. Um, some of the local townsfolk uh, were a little worried about camps of young men uh, nearby and what that would do when their daughters were in danger and all that. Um, the story goes up at Pokagon near Angola. The Angola merchants were, were not too pleased with that idea. So the foreman of the, uh, of the camp decided he would pay the boys. They got $5 a month out of the 30 that they were paid, 25 of them went home to their families. And in many cases, that was the only income their families were getting. But the boys got $5 to spend for themselves or save it as the case may be. They got their meals, they got their clothes, everything else, but they, you know, incidentals. Mm -hmm. So they had that and he decided he would pay them in silver dollars. Lo and behold, all these silver dollars were showing up in the tills of the Angola uh, storekeepers. And suddenly they they weren't complaining so much about the CCC camp five miles <laughs> away. <laughs> but yeah, uh, Fokagan is a really good example of the CCC at its best. Uh, the camp was there from 1934 until the end of the CCC in early 42. And they built everything there except the inn, which was mm -hmm. really the only building that had been built up to that time. They even built the precursor of today's uh, toboggan slide there. But all the buildings, the saddle barn and the uh, uh, different shelters there, uh, there were, are some uh, cabins outside the, the uh, inn, um, you name it. And they're all built beautifully of timber. And again, that field stove that is uh, so prevalent up in Northern Indiana. All that was built by the CCC, built the trails too. They built a spring shelter around the spring that used to be a horse trail. It's now a pedestrian trail, but it was initially created for a place to stop and, and water the horses. So and we were, yeah, we were talking before the program about the uh, use of rocks in some of the parks in, in Mishawaka. And yeah. We had an interesting story there that uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, they had to go out, they had to go out in the farmer's fields to find things they're running yeah, out of the trail. Uh, the, the WPA especially, uh, well, the CCT was, was told to, this was a, uh, a National Park Service uh, mandate was to make buildings uh, look like their surroundings so they would use natural materials. But in the case of the WPA, uh, the bulk of WPA money was mandated to go to pay labor so that more people could be employed. It was the local sponsor who needed to provide tools and materials and so forth. Well, where were they going to get the materials? We don't have a lot of money. Well, gee, we have a little stone around here. This is Northern Indiana. This is glacial moraine. The stones keep coming up every year in the farmer's fields and that's what they use. So the farmers were pretty happy with the WPA after a while too, because hordes of WPA guys would go out in the fields and collect these stones. And there was so much construction going on in St. Joseph County that by 1936, they were actually beginning to run out of stones, believe it or not, and they were having to go farther and farther afield from South Bend in order to gather up these stones. Let's take a look at some of the uh, other projects uh, that the various New Deal agencies were involved with, including the FERA with the Federal Emergency Relief Administration, uh, the CWA, the Civil Works Administration, the Public Works Administration, that all flowed into the WPA. So right. Sally, if we could uh, get some of those images up on the screen, we'll talk about some of them. Yeah, uh, FERA <laughs> was uh, the Federal Emergency Relief Act, which was, yeah. and then it became administration, uh, which was one of, again, one of Roosevelt's first 100 days programs. Um, and, and that was, uh, let's see, I think that was, April that, that was signed. Right. Um, and they started to build things, uh, started to get on roads right away. So those tended to be continuing projects, road work road. and street, uh, street repair and uh, re replacement of bricks and so forth. That was uh, really the probably the biggest area of WPA work and, and the most visible. They were out there working in the streets. Uh, again, erosion control was not just CCC, the WPA worked on these two in, in that they dug ditches along county roads for drainage. Right. This, uh, what is this? That's this is in Corridon, Indiana. Yeah. This is sewer work. They did a lot of sewer work, in, particularly in the small towns. 
And that on the right is uh, one of several. Uh, the system of roadside parks began in the late 30s. And who worked on them mostly it was the WPA who built the first uh, oh, several dozen uh, roadside parks. And that project continued. Uh, they continued to build roadside parks into the very early 60s. And about then, uh, the Department of Transportation stopped building them. But those that Department of Transportation was a sponsor of roadside parks. And initially, they built these in uh, historic areas. And this mm -hmm. was an old spring near Parkersburg, which is in mm, Putnam County, I believe. Had to think about that. It's on 231. I believe it's Putnam County, south of Crawfordsville. Um, and this, this actually, when I first photographed it, the spring was still working. It has since been uh, closed up, whether naturally or intentionally, just to because it was poison, or maybe people were, were vandalizing it. I'm not sure, but it's no longer flowing. But it was at the time I first discovered it in the 80s. Um, this was one. Uh, there were several others that were built along springs. Another used to be outside Knightstown on US 40. Again, that was a stagecoach stop in, in the uh, 19th century. So they like to bring in the history of the area when they built these. And usually that consisted of creating a nice wall around the spring, uh, a basin to catch the water and things like that. And then for a whole roadside park, they would build um, benches and uh, picnic, uh, picnic tables and so forth. Sometimes uh, even a restroom. And uh, depending, there's one that still stands. There's not many of these around anymore, but one that still stands that the WPA built is in Martin County. It's, um, let's see, it's not far from Shoals. It's west of Shoals, about a mile. And it's still there, uh, still has a lot of those features at it. I'm always impressed by the breadth of, uh, by the wide, Incredible. wide range of projects that the WPA was involved with. So you, can you talk a little bit about the various, you know, things that the WPA workers did? I mean, they were, did, a, did a lot. They did everything. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, well, for, just to start with construction, uh, about anything you think of of public nature, streets and streets and sidewalks. In fact, you'll still find occasionally a sidewalk that has WPA stamped in it. That was uh, stamped in the wet cement. Um, they have gradually been replaced, but they most of the time don't need to. Uh, WP sidewalks are incredibly strong. They hold up very well. There's a limestone sidewalk, of course, uh, in uh, Bloomington that is near uh, a WPA wall across the way that's around a school. So they, they did a lot of that sort of thing. Streets, uh, streets, sidewalks, farm to market roads was a big thing. That, mm -hmm. that call for farm to market roads had started early on back in the late 19th century. Uh, never did get them all built. So the WPA started to do more of that. But they also worked on, on highways too. Large parts of US 40 were made into four lane divided stretches by the WPA. There were six long stretches, not, not the entire US 40 across Indiana, but six long stretches of it were made four lane divided by the WPA. Then, then you go into the infrastructure, uh, sewers, uh, water lines. A lot of those were taken care of by PWA, which we didn't get into, but we can. <clears throat> but uh, the smaller projects that they did uh, were for the smaller towns. Now this here is a fish hatchery. Uh, it isn't anymore. Uh, I, I believe the state still owns the part of the property that's on the other side of the road. This is up in Orland. I believe that's Highway 327, if I remember correctly. Orland is in Steuben County, they were, WPA did a lot of work. This was an incredible fish hatchery. This, in fact, this property is listed in the National Register of Historic Places. And they, uh, they built this beautiful gateway into it and all the fish rearing ponds, and I believe there were 12, they built the headquarters um, and some other uh, ancillary buildings, and also a few park benches and uh, picnic tables and such, all using this rock work. Uh, in the uh, city parks, of course, is where they really shone. And as I was talking to you earlier, uh, parks in Mishawaka really benefited, for example, Mer Merrifield, uh, Petro, Eberhardt parks in Mishawaka, also some smaller ones. They, they created some along the river. There's a a Lane Park and Rose Park. I don't know if you know those. This is in Vincennes. This is uh, an incredible set of, there are four of these uh, 
uh, these panels that are relief carvings of basically the pioneers conquering the Indians, but mm. so we're not so politically correct. Right. But this is uh, Kimmel Park along the Wabash River in Vincennes. Unfortunately, this is not being well cared for today. It is listed in the National Register, but the city gave it up yeah. and gave it to Vincennes University. Who now, do these projects follow all follow the same style, or do they vary from location to location across? The uh, stylistically, they well, uh, there was a style that we now know as park rustic. So in parks, they often use that kind of style, which was, uh, of course, again, uh, blending the uh, building into the landscape and so forth. But it was uh, largely because of the materials they used. So in northern Indiana, again, they were using the mm -hmm. the stones from uh, from the fields, the glacial stones in uh, around Bloomington, Bedford area, uh, down into Knox County, as you see with Vincennes, they were using limestone, a lot of the scrap limestone that wasn't uh, usable for, for uh, commercial purposes. And of course, that was slowed down a lot anyway. In southern Indiana, there was still a wealth of timber. So you see more timber construction down there. Uh, I would say the northern third of Indiana, most of the park buildings do use the the rock work there. Are, and they went to towns so small that they hadn't even thought of having parks to, before. There's a town called Royal Center mm -hmm. up on, oh, yeah. um, what is that, 35, I think it's on, way up in uh, northern Indiana. And that has a, a lovely park called Rhea Park. The land was donated, and but they didn't have any money, but they had, they had rocks and they had men who needed work. And so the WP created a very nice park up there. There's another one in North Liberty that is listed in the National Register that has beautiful rock work. The CCC did some flood control work in it. And then after they were done there, the WPA came in and, and uh, made a bathhouse, created a, a little swimming pool out of the creek, which was done back in the 30s. A lot of work the WPA did and the CCC were to create swimming areas out of natural water, which of course we don't, we don't do today, but they- yeah. How did these small communities get these projects? Did they have Sorry? to petition that? How did these small communities ah. get these projects? How did you get a project in your area? Did you petition the state? How did it come about? You asked. <laughs> you asked. Okay. So uh, well, Governor McNutt, when he came in, he uh, he took office two months before Roosevelt took office because we used to inaugurate our presidents in March. So right. uh, McNutt took office in January, and he said, "Hmm, I know the New Deal's coming. How can I?" structure the state government so that we can get the best deal out of this. And so he did, he completely restructured this, the state government, very controversial, uh, streamlined it a lot and just set it up in such a way that he was, he was, it was well suited to, to receive these funds. He created the Governor's Commission on Unemployment Relief, which took a lot of power out of the hands of the townships and counties, which a lot of patronage, you know, and it's faced a lot of corruption. Um, they could still ask, and they still could come up with their own projects, and they did, but they had to go through the GCUR, as it was called, and the GCUR was the uh, administrative body that worked with the feds to get the money. So they could they could uh, request, there were forms, and you just came in and asked, basically, fill okay. out the form, and there you are. Great. Now, it was, it was inherently right. not political, I have, to, I have to say. Now, I know, of course, there's always exceptions that happen, but Harry Hopkins, who ran WPA from, from the federal level, and he, he had the mandate from Roosevelt to do this. This is not about politics. You give a Republican a job as much as a Democrat. So. You mentioned, of course, uh, you know, the park in Michigan City, the Patel Park in Mishawaka. Are there other projects that are particular favorites of yours that still survive from the WPA and some that might no longer be around that, that you uh -huh. research? Gosh. Um, well, you know, you mentioned uh, odd projects that people wouldn't even think of. And one is still around, although it's not, um, it's not used the same way it was as Lincoln Pioneer Village in Rockport. Uh, the idea of recreation as an opportunity to improve yourself was, was a very big idea in the 20s and into the 30s. So the idea of educational recreation uh, took hold. And especially after uh, Williamsburg uh, already existed. In, and so local communities began to look around, what do we have historic that we can turn into 
you know, a tourist attraction, basically. Right. And so Spencer County in Indiana is, is the center of, of Lincoln lore in Indiana. And so they decided this was the uh, brainchild of George Honig, who is a, was a well-known sculptor in, uh, in the region. And he was also a lover of Lincoln. So he thought that uh, they could create a Lincoln pioneer village in, in Rockport, Indiana. And he designed it. And he at first applied to the CWA, the Civil Works Administration, which was only in effect from November 1933 to March of 1934. It was only set up as a temporary work project, but it was sort of a, a shakedown cruise for WPA to see what worked mm -hmm. and what did. That was also under Harry Hopkins' auspices. So CWA ended too quickly, but after CWA ended, FERA, remember, we're going back to the alphabet again, but the Federal Emergency Relief Administration actually took on a, a larger work relief component. And so they applied to FERA, and that's where um, Lincoln Pioneer Village construction started. And then they, when WPA came into being, they applied again and added more buildings. The idea of Lincoln Pioneer Village was not that this was the village that Lincoln lived in, but each specific building was a building that was significant in Lincoln's life, in Lincoln's Indiana life. So it was partly to show what an 1820s settlement would look like, but also each individual building, tough, tough interpretation, I must say. Right. Each individual building was uh, representative of somebody's house who was important or so forth, the tavern that he stayed in, whatever. And, and it still stands. And it is listed in the National Register. They got it going again. And when I was a child, it was a public thing. And we actually took a school trip all the way down to Southern Indiana to see this. So I remember this from way back then. <laughs> so well, it was real, I, was, real I remember that in 1968, when Bobby Kennedy was running in for the Democratic presidential primary, one of his stops was at the Lincoln Pioneer Village because he wanted to connect with Hoosier history. So oh, that is, that, cool. <laughs> that is cool. Well, 68, it was still going. It was still yeah. going yeah. strong as a tourist attraction. Then it closed for a long time and there were some misguided attempts to reopen it. And then, uh, then they, uh, they got involved with wanting to be in the National Register. They had been told they couldn't be because they're a replica. And I said, no, you're historic in your own right, right. because of being a New Deal historic project. Mm -hmm. uh, another New Deal project what? like that is in Illinois. New Salem was also mm -hmm. a New Deal project. Now, one of the unusual uh, sites that I remember from the slides that you shared with us was the one in Goshen, Cali. Oh, that? yes. Because the that, Dillinger booth. <laughs> the Dillinger booth, yeah. Let's try to get to find that one. And someone mentioned that Goshen seemed to have a lot of projects from the, the there is there is Dillinger. There you go. Well, Elkhart County uh, and St. Joe County, both up in the Michigan area, were very busy with, uh, with New Deal projects. Yeah, the uh, one on the right is clearly very shortly after it was uh, completed. All right, 1950s, I see. Never mind. Not yeah. quite so complete. Uh, it was completed in 1935, I believe, 1936, and... So what is this it, thing? Well, this is a police post, and at okay. the time this was built, there were two banks on opposite uh -huh. corners, and so policemen would, would stay in there lest some bank robber would come in mm -hmm. and attempt to uh, stage a bank robbery. Now, by the time it was finished, Dillinger was dead. But they, the, the local wags called it the Dillinger booths nonetheless. <laughs> Later on, it, it, it stayed in use because that is a busy street. That's a highway running through there. The Lincoln Highway, as a matter of fact. And um, it was used as a crossing guard station for a while for the kids. But it, it languished for years. It was just there. And then people began to uh, appreciate it. And now it too is listed in the National Register. Right. Now, in nice Art Deco reason, design, I point out. It is. It's wonderful. Uh, of course, one of the projects was, of course, the Glenn, Glenn Black uh, and WP <laughs> workers at Angel Mounds in Evansville. And Yeah, they did a lot of, uh, I, I recently attended a talk a few years ago. Uh, they did, uh, they really were a great help to archaeologists. Uh, like Glenn Black used, used the WP workers and trained them. And many of them actually went on to become archaeologists themselves. And that's, that's really cool. Uh, 
what when I first went down there to find out what was still standing, there was quite a bit of it still left. Now there's just one or two buildings left of, of the WPA down there, but at least they have saved those. And now they do interpret that aspect of, uh, of, the, of the Angel Mounds as well. Um, they did a lot of things that aren't so visible. Um, a lot of the small town libraries I went to, partly to do research and partly because I was in their town, uh, showed me books that the WPA had bound that they still had and were still on the shelves. This was a very desperate need because obviously the libraries uh, no longer had the funds to buy new books right. and more people were coming into the library partly because they had more leisure time and partly because they wanted to improve themselves and so they were having all these tattered books that they, they couldn't put on the shelves anymore. So the WPA bookbinding project was very important. Uh, we, too. Yeah, uh, we, sewing we, projects. Yeah. Uh, almost every county had one. Before we get into some of the questions from our uh, participants this evening, I want to get uh, your feelings and uh, your uh, what you learn from WPA workers who are actually employed by the WPA. What they told you when you went out and talked to them about uh, their experiences. Uh, what was it like for them? Did they have fond memories of their work? You know, uh, because of all the bad press about WPA, when I first started this project back in the early 80s, my heavens, um, they, I, I had a, a fear that they uh, might not be willing to talk to me because they, they you know, they might not, they might be ashamed even that they did this, but no, absolutely not. They were very proud of what they had done. And they explained a lot of these, of the sources of these criticisms to me. Uh, for instance, if you're, if you're uh, uh, digging a ditch and filling up a filling up a wheelbarrow, if the guy goes away with the wheelbarrow full of dirt, you can't you can't right. be digging so anymore until he comes back with the wheelbarrow. You know, so there's things like that. They WPA was uh, said by its detractors to stand for we piddle around. This was a, a common a common thing, but in, not really. They worked very hard. Uh, one guy up in Marion uh, took me over to the the park in Marion, the city park, Mather Park, I think it is. And he, he pointed around and he said, well, I, I worked on that and I worked on that. It's still here. And that was the beauty of it, they say. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's give me a big smile and say, it's still here. I contributed this. So well, they yeah. were for the most part proud of it. Well, I think it shows the quality of their workmanship because all the, yeah. a lot of these things are still around after many, many, many years. And they're in still Oh, exactly. Yeah. Uh, in terms of the CCC, uh, now they, they let a lot of them languish just for uh, lacking regular maintenance, but uh, now they have come to appreciate it. And uh, all the CCC buildings, I think, are fairly safe in our state parks because they, they are now appreciated for what they are. But the WPA construction was good, too. Now, here, this is the Public Works Administration, uh, which is a, uh, a large scale uh, construction set of construction projects. This was run a little differently. This was a grants program, um, a matching grants program, as opposed to the WPA, which was they would you applied for the funds and you you got them uh, with your promise that 90% of the funds had to go for labor. Uh, PWA was you came up with a large scale construction project like say, oh, how about a Coliseum at the Indiana Fairgrounds? And you applied and they would, if they, they okayed it, you would get, up to 45% of the money. You had to find the rest somewhere else. Now, these projects could also use WPA labor. They could apply for that, and some did. Uh, but in this case, uh, this, this is a, one of the more beautiful PWA mm -hmm. projects we have. Lock Hill Gardens, wonderful. In fact, Indiana probably had the finest public okay. housing of all the many PWA housing projects there were. This was a beautiful thing. And as you may remember, Ray, I tried very hard to save the whole thing years right. ago, but uh, we did not. We have six, uh, six buildings of these left and, and a seventh uh, commercial building that was part of it. And they are listed in the National Register, but I sure wish we had the whole thing. This, you can see from the design that all the apartment buildings had good views, good ventilation. Um, they all had some sun at least uh, in some part of the day. These are beautifully designed, and yet these were for poor folks. Gee whiz, beautiful housing for poor folks. Imagine that. 
So, uh, but this was generally agreed by PWA officials at Indiana with Lockfield Gardens had the finest example of it. There was another project down in Evansville as well, Lincoln Gardens. It was not the same design though. Were, I know that the CCC companies were segregated. Uh, was that, does that uh, follow the same pattern for WPA projects where workers, uh, African-American workers segregated from their white counterparts? Do, do you know that? Somewhat, somewhat. Um, the CCC actually initially was not segregated, but of uh -huh. course the country was segregated. Right. Uh, it's really just reflective of the times rather than intentionally, of course, down south, it had to be. Um, I actually ran into, in Spring Mill, um, one of the early companies that served there was in fact uh, integrated, although they kept uh, the black guys in a separate barracks. So they were segregated within, but they gave that up and they later did have a black company there. And they, that was a separate part of the park. And then another company, a white company was there and they were in a different part of the park. So they did maintain the segregation, unfortunately, but again, reflective of the times. Uh, Eleanor was not happy about that, but she was also right. realistic. Uh, WPA was, since each job had different tasks, it was uh, easier to be somewhat integrated on it. They certainly did hire, hire uh, Black unemployed, not perhaps at the percentage because there were more, it was a higher percentage of Blacks unemployed than whites, although everybody had the problem. So in that regard, they were not represented, but it was representative of the population, although not necessarily the amount of unemployment involved. Of course, the federal government was also heavily involved in uh, helping out artists and, and writers. You had the WPA mm -hmm. guides for each state. Did the, uh, were the- Indiana like the was considered one of the best, by the way. Yes, that's right. Mm -hmm. And um, were the, Post office murals uh, that propped up around the state, was that part of the WPA as well, or did that come? That from was a, a different project. That was the federal program. arts project, which had a variety of names. Uh, the post office murals were actually under the auspices of the treasury. Some of the same artists also did do, there were WPA artists as well. We have an example in Indianapolis in the Naval Armory. There are four huge murals in what used to be the drill room. This is now the gym of uh, Riverside High School because the Naval Armory is an interesting example of adaptive reuse. It's now a high school. Right. But at the time, um, when there it was Naval, go. the huge gym, it's essentially the gymnasium, it was called the drill room. And overseeing it are four large murals of famous Naval battles, like don't give up the ship and never be, whatever, mm -hmm. never, uh, I've just begun to fight, right. yeah, John Paul Jones. Um, and they are, I don't remember the dimensions, but they're huge. And that was Charles Bowerly was the artist on that. And he, he was working for the WPA to do that. There's a number of public buildings that have WPA uh, large paintings or even mural size uh, works in them. Uh, the courthouse in um, Jennings County has several. One has, uh, one is a painting of Lincoln sitting down as a, a young man sort of in a dreamy state, leaning mm -hmm. against a tree. And off in the, I guess, future are these large modern buildings. And that's in the Jennings County Courthouse. Uh, a lot of schools have paintings in them that were WPA, but there was our uh, disappearing. Hospitals also benefited from WPA artists. Mm -hmm. Now were schools uh, actually built as part of the WPA project? They oh yes, many, schools? many, many schools uh, were built by the WPA. Um, Fewer and fewer of them survive now that we're, what, 80 years hence, mm -hmm. something like that. So there's almost, yeah, Thomas Al High School. Al High School, Al High School, High School is, is uh, both PWA and WPA okay. funds were involved in that. Uh, and that does still stand and is still in use as a charter school, is it not? I think so. And then there's courthouses as well, the Shelby, uh, Shelbyville courthouse. PWA did three courthouses, uh, Shelbyville, Shelbyville and uh, Kokomo and Covington. And they all are the height of gorgeous Art Deco architecture, just beautiful. Covington has murals in it, uh, some of which are rather controversial and almost socialistic. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> 
You talked about the, how the workers view the WPA projects. I assume local businesses, especially uh, construction firms, uh, were highly pleased with the efforts uh, of the project as well. Do you, did you come across anything in your research that you get an idea how business reacted uh, to these projects? Well, it varied with the business. The, obviously, the retail businesses were thrilled to get money right. instead of chits, chits mm -hmm. being uh, pieces of paper that you could buy so many uh, so, so many dollars worth of groceries and so on. Uh, they were getting real money. Mm -hmm. uh, so they were happy. Most most retailers were, were pretty happy with WPA actually, and they paid cash and they paid, initially they paid every two weeks. And then later on, they realized weekly was even better for the economy to keep it rolling. So they, they paid men, men and women by the week. Um, there were problems initially, and most of these were most of these were worked out uh, with unions and such because okay, you're you're taking away our laborers, but they tried to establish a balance. Uh, they would pay the WPA workers more than they would get on direct relief, but less than they would get in private industry if there was industry. Mm -hmm. And this is this is where some of the other uh, economic stimulation came in. So. For the most part, they were okay with it after after they had an initial shakedown cruise, you could say. I think you mentioned some of the sewing projects, but were there other uh, uh, projects geared specifically toward women in the state? Um, the sewing projects I should throw in was to create was to make clothes that were for people on relief who were even poorer than the people who were doing the sewing. Uh, another sewing project that is really interesting is they made dolls and they made dolls for toys, yes, but they made educational dolls. And I've run into these periodically. You'll see them sometimes again in the small towns where they where they haven't thrown these things away happily. Uh, you'll see dolls in costumes of a certain era. You'll see uh, furniture of that same scale. Of a certain era, so you can make uh, you have dioramas of say a pioneer cabin. There's uh, there's one of those in the Princeton Library in Southern Indiana. I ran into. I was I was just so thrilled to see it. It was a WPA project. Uh, the Children's Museum has some, um, or at least had some on display, uh, uh, doll sized furniture of of different eras. But another thing they did was dolls of other countries, and up in South Bend. They used to have the, the school corporation had a set of dolls of all nations in, in the traditional costumes, you know, a man and woman doll, uh, Greek and Italian and Romanian and what have you, all, all the different costumes. And they would take these around to the schools. And I would assume that it was a WPA teacher out of work who would take these to the schools and explain these to the different kids. So they put a lot of teachers to work too. And that was again, a place where women could be employed. Um, they were employed as nurses too, of course. And then the uh, canning projects, again, uh, a means of, of uh, having food for people even poorer. Mm -hmm. Every single county in Indiana had a canning project and usually this took place in some abandoned, uh, disused anyway, factory. And they would set that up for whatever produce was produced in that particular county. But we did get a comment from one of the uh, uh, participants this evening, Jennifer, collections manager at the Children's Museum, and they ah. still have the dolls and most of Yay. the dioramas <laughs> and even models. So that's good to know. Very good. Uh, now These are with, great teaching tools. They are. With things opening up, we hope this summer, perhaps people getting back on, on the road and maybe uh, you know wandering Indiana once again. Yes. Is there a favorite spot that you suggest that they could go visit to see uh, a number of WPA projects in one place? Well, uh, or, or or favorites that we haven't talked our, about. Our Mich our Michiana is is a very good place for them. Uh, yeah. South Bend also ne next to next to next to Mishawaka. Of course, it should be Mishawaka South Bend, not South That's Bend. Right. That's right. Uh, South Bend's parks also benefited greatly. Um, when I grew up, uh, we would often go to Leaper Park, which used to have a duck pond. I understand they took that out though, oh, but uh, that was another WPA project. Duck ponds and monkey islands were a big thing. I did mention the park in Michigan City, but I didn't describe it very much. There was a zoo there as well, uh, a zoo, and there's a greenhouse, which was recently restored. 
uh, the tower on top of the dunes. There's a breakwater that was built by the WPA uh, along the beach. So get to walk out to that wonderful lighthouse at the end of the pier, which that's older, but the uh, breakwater is the WPA project. The and there's a lighthouse south. museum too, but I don't think that was part yeah. of the WPA. No, it's there. <laughs> that's old. It's there though. But that, that's a great destination. But that yeah. entire park was uh, largely, almost entirely developed by the WPA, although it is older. But most of the resources there are from the uh, New Deal era. But the zoo is especially nice, and it's now an accredited zoo. It may not have been originally, but uh, they have reconfigured the. Uh, they they don't use a lot of the really cute WPA buildings that were built of the uh, recycled stonework there. The interesting thing about that part that I love is uh, the WPA also, alas, demolished buildings, and they would save everything. They would save the the chunks of concrete, the flooring, and everything, and. And they created shelters and park benches out of it. Nobody's going to steal those park benches. They're, they're, <laughs> they probably weigh about a ton, you know. And there's a, a really nice shelter that is uh, uh, the floor of it is chunks of that uh, ceramic hexagonal tile that is usually in institutional bathrooms. So whatever they tore down, they took this out of the bathroom and set the chunks in concrete to create a very interesting mosaic floor. So that is, Michigan City is definitely a good destination. Also, Connorsville, the park in Connorsville has a, a wealth of, of uh, WPA um, buildings in it. And um, let's see, I think it's the NYA, which I didn't mention before, the National Youth Administration, which was sort of a junior WPA that went into effect about uh, two months after the WPA began. Yeah, there you go. There you go. Um, the National Youth Administration was geared toward young people still in school, both high school and college. And they did a lot of clerical work, things like that. Turns out my mother was a WPA clerical worker. I didn't know that till I started this project. Oh yeah, I worked for NYA. You can <laughs> tell me more. Um, but uh, they were, this was a means of they're making enough money that they could stay in school, which was mm -hmm. always the goal. Uh, the, the, uh, the shelter house there in the upper left corner is the uh, shelter house outside a, w, a WPA built school in Vernon, Indiana. And there's an identical shelter to this in Greenwood, Indiana in their old city park. Although it must be very forlorn now because they've completely reconfigured that park and there's not a thing left except that uh, NYA shelter in that park that is, that is uh, from that era. Below that is a really cool building. This is Creekstone in this case. This is in um, Frankfort, Indiana, the TPA Park, which was uh, uh, started in 1911. But that when the New Deal came along, they did a lot of work there. And a lot of it was by NYA. And that, uh, mm -hmm. that uh, plaque there is uh, identical to a plaque that is on that building picture, which is a garage. And the garage matches the uh, original park building the original park office next to it, which was made of the creek stone. They also did several, uh, oh, things like fountains and uh, statue bases and things like that in the park and built that rock wall as well. Yeah. In our final couple of minutes here, I wanna ask you because of your expertise in our state parks, is there one state park that you recommend visiting that has a variety of WPA projects that they could also enjoy? Um, not so much WPA because the CCC was, CCC, was very yeah. busy in our state parks. Uh, Pokagon probably has the most, the, uh, mm -hmm. the entire park is listed in the National Register because of its wealth of CCC projects. Although the Cormix Creek has a great many mm -hmm. uh, and several of uh, its resources are individually listed in the National Register. Turkey Run is another and uh, Clifty Falls. Those four probably have the most uh, collections. Another odd state park I would mention in that their work doesn't look like the rest, and stylistically it does, but not materially, and that is Shackamack, which was, um, their buildings are mostly brick, but when you think about it, clay, that is, it is Clay County, that's just a, a coincidence, but clay is the abundant natural resource there. So right. the bricks, uh, are, are the native material in, in Shackamack. So that's what their buildings are made of. But stylistically, they're very similar to the others in the state parks. But those, those five, I guess, would have the largest collections. They're all great places, yeah, to visit. Oh, yeah. I've been to, yeah. needless to say, I've been to them all. Yeah. Sea Forest, too, are 
are good places to find find that work. I love the old fish hatcheries. Those are mostly WPA. Um, there's one that's still in use and uh, still very much intact. That was a WPA project in Lawrence County. It's called Avoca. Mm -hmm. Well, Glory June, I want to thank you for sharing your expertise with us uh, this evening. And uh, I really appreciate it. Uh, great conversation. And I want to throw it back to Callie with a, a few final words. Thank you so much, Ray and Glory June, for this great conversation. I appreciate you both taking the time. And I learned about a whole bunch of buildings that I need to go find when <laughs> I'm uh, on my road trips this summer, because don't you believe I'm getting out in the state this year? <laughs> <laughs> um, and, thank, and thank you all for joining us tonight. If you enjoyed this program, we hope you'll consider coming back for more. As I mentioned at the top of our program, we have more History Happy Hours coming soon. Uh, on May 20th, you can learn more about the 500 Festival Princess Program with an awesome panel of alumni, board members, and current princess even. And then stay tuned for an upcoming conversation on the history of Juneteenth, heritage canning, and so much more. You can join us on Saturday, May 8th for a conversation on how to engage young researchers at our research roundtable. It's a great time to have a conversation about what research you're doing, what brick walls are you hitting, and how we can all help each other out. And then come back next Thursday, May 13th for a virtual road trip as we're exploring some of Indiana's favorite historic places to vacation and maybe some fun ideas to visit um, as the summer months are coming. Just like you got a whole bunch of ideas tonight too. Mm -hmm. um, you can find out how to register for all of those programs and what's coming up in the link that's in the chat right now. Thanks, Marianne. Uh, we'll be posting this conversation to our YouTube channel and our website in the upcoming weeks. In the meantime, if you'd like to revisit any of our previous free programs, like happy hours like this, you can do that at YouTube or on our website. The link is in the chat right now. Go check out the replay. There's some great topics. Um, and then if you missed your chance to donate or would like to make a further gift to the Indiana Historical Society, we're gonna drop that link into the chat uh, too. That donation allows us to continue to provide programs like this and share Hoosier stories in the future. You're gonna get an email from us tomorrow, like I mentioned earlier at the top of the program, that will have all the links that I've shared tonight along with a survey. It'll take you about one minute. We'd love to know what you thought and how we can make programs like this better in the future. So with that, we hope you'll stay safe and stay healthy. Thank you so much for coming and we can't wait to see you at a program in the future. Bye everybody. <laughs>
there were a couple of like Lincoln yeah, Highway, yeah. like very specific location based things. And I think that we, if we send out the Living New Deal, they'll be able to handle that. Um, but for the most part, I think we got to almost everything. We tried to answer a number of them. Someone asked about Glenn Black and I could put a link in there. Yeah. Um, someone asked what were city parks? And then there was sort no, of- a, what, were, what were roadside no, parks? Roadside, roadside parks. parks. Oh, and there that's was, pretty sad. <laughs> Well, that's it's what not, the person who wrote an answer said, kind of, and I was like, oh. Yeah, you, yeah, you he, must he be was, young. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, he was a little condescending really to, yeah. to that individual asking the question. So that's why when I asked Yeah, that. when I was a kid, we, my family, we would just stop there and have a picnic lunch for real. Yeah. Yeah. But um, there's still, oh, I'd say, somebody asked me that question just recently. I said I thought about eight or 10 still survive. That's all. So, I, yeah, I, I, I keep discovering, you know, that's something I probably should have brought out. I, every so often I discover a project that I hadn't found before. They're, mm -hmm. they're still out there. Uh, one of them, Ray, was in uh, South Bend on the other side of the river. I, I did a nomination for all the stonework uh, on, on the IUSB side. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Along uh, that boulevard, there yeah. was an incredible amount of great stonework there. But there, there was a stone stairway on the other side that I just they they just uncovered it because this was so overgrown. Mm -hmm. I went to look at it about maybe about three years ago. Uh, they asked me to evaluate. And I said, well, "Yeah, this is WP. I don't know why it's here." <laughs> at one time, but, it was for something, yeah. Yeah, but I mean, yeah. it should it should have been included in the nomination had I known it existed. But it was invisible, completely yeah. covered up. And, um, I just want to say, Anna, did everything go okay from your end once we got our friend um, on? Yes, yeah, yeah. I didn't have anybody email or uh, call in, so we were good. How many were there? How many actual? Uh, um, I saw the, the highest number I saw was 64, um, yeah. but we'll see what that number ends up being when we download the, the finalized list from Zoom tomorrow. Okay. That's pretty cool. And um, there was one on Facebook that by the time it came in, I was just like, you can catch the replay, <laughs> okay. <laughs> but otherwise, um, yeah, okay, cool. Um, well, thank you everyone. I wanna, Anna, I do have links for you. Um, so we'll kind of, Marianne, yeah. I was just gonna say, Glory June, I'm gonna head up there and um, help you get logged off and everything so you can. Okay, thank you. And Anna, do you want me to send those to you or Natalie or both? I would send them to Natalie because I'm actually out of the office tomorrow. So am yeah. I. Look at you. Me too. Yay. Because <laughs> <laughs> I have to be here on Saturday, but you do one you know, day a I'll week. Take it. <laughs> one day a week, every other day. What is how do you work it? Oh um, yes. I Oh, so mine is a comp day, so I will kind of be the manager on duty on Saturday. So because of that, I will kind of just take off Friday to kind of make up for it. I have to I'm, go do Mother's Day things with my family, so I'm going to go be a good child. And I'm just getting a haircut. Oh, that's also very important. Is it going to look any different? No, shorter, no? that's all. Oh, okay. Still gray, just shorter. <laughs> You're not going to do the dye job? <laughs> no, 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 no dye job. I hear that the gray helps people, um, not that Rain needs it to be like uh, realized as a scholar and a, and an expert, but I've heard that if the gray or my hair goes, the more expert they'll think I do. Oh, is that right? Yeah. That's what I've heard. I don't know. I should be taken very seriously. Now. That's right. <laughs> Well, thank you so much. I'll let Marianne, um, Marianne will come uh, help get you out. Ray, thanks again. You're always there a is, champ. Glad to do there it. There is something, Callie, that comes up in the way of a question. I'll be, you know, just email me. I'll be happy to yeah, answer it. I'm happy to pass that along. Yeah. So okay. thanks, everyone. I'm going to shut it down. Okay. Bye. Bye. Bye.